Hi everyone! I'm sure many of you, just like me, use cordless power tools. Nowadays, thanks to high-capacity batteries and efficient brushless motors, cordless tools can easily compete with corded tools, even the powerful ones. And a tool like a screwdriver is already hard to imagine being corded. The downside of power tools is that each manufacturer creates their own battery standard, and as a result, we usually try to buy all subsequent tools to match the standard of the first one we bought. A long time ago, I chose the 18V Makita standard for myself because I believe it's the most versatile, popular, and reliable standard. Almost all of my power tools are cheap Chinese models that use this battery standard. I gave up on the idea of a dedicated charger a long time ago. The most universal charger is a laboratory power supply. You can use it to charge any batteries of any standard. But for a while now, I've wanted to make something that would let me charge these kinds of batteries using regular smartphone chargers through a Type-C port. Something like an adapter where you insert the battery, and then connect the adapter to a smartphone charger via Type-C. The problem is that most modern chargers can output 5, 9, or 12 volts, and in some cases up to 20 volts. In even rarer cases, I'd say extremely rare, up to 28 volts according to the Power Delivery 3.1 protocol. The thing is, the charge termination voltage for 18 volt lithium batteries is 21 volts, so you'll need a boost charging system, and it also has to have current limiting and voltage stabilization functions. Right in front of you is the schematic for such a charging device. By the way, this charger is very powerful, about 60 watts, and it can charge your battery with currents up to 3 amps. Of course, that's if your battery supports charging at higher currents. I should mention that this is a finished project, which I published on OSHD Lab. Anyone interested can replicate it. There's a fee and everything else. In my case, everything will be assembled on high-quality factory-made boards, which I ordered, of course, from JLCPCB in a fairly large quantity, since I plan to make several of these chargers. JLCPCB is a leading manufacturer of printed circuit boards for projects of any complexity and for any purpose. The company can manufacture high-quality printed circuit boards with up to 32 layers. They offer a wide selection of solder mask colors, trace finishes, board thicknesses, and much more. Board prices start at just $2 for a batch of 5 boards size 10 by 10 cm, and there's also a 30% coupon available for 6-layer printed circuit boards. JLC is a company with a fully integrated production cycle. Strict quality control ensures the boards are always perfect. And that's how it will always be. Production times for boards are just a few days, but there's also an express service for manufacturing in just 24 hours. Ordering boards is very simple. Just upload your project archive with the original Gerber files, select the options you need, pay for your order, and that's it. The company also offers board assembly, stencil creation, and commercial 3D printing services. JLCPCB is easy to use, affordable to manufacture with, and reliable in operation. Links are in the description. The circuit is based on the CN3300 controller. This is a classic non-synchronous boost voltage converter. The chip controls a pair of powerful in-channel MOSFETs that are connected in parallel. The main boosting component of the circuit is the inductor. This is a single-ended circuit, and it works as follows. The chip generates a control pulse that goes to the gates of the switches, causing them to activate. With the switches open, power is routed to the inductor, and energy begins to accumulate in the inductor. Next, the control signal goes low. The switches turn off. The inductor releases the stored energy as a self-induction spike. The amplitude of this spike is much higher than the supply voltage and has the opposite polarity. So when the switches were open at the specified inductor terminal, the power ground was applied. During self-induction, the polarity reverses, and now there will be a positive voltage here. The self-induction voltage charges the output capacitors through the diodes and powers the load. During the pauses, when the transistors are open and there's nothing at the output, the load is powered by the energy stored in the capacitor. The microchip monitors the output voltage through the specified resistive divider. The output voltage from the divider is compared with the reference voltage of the microchip, and if it is higher than the required value, 
the controller reduces the duration of the control pulses, so the switches will remain open for less time. As a result, less energy will be pumped into the inductor, which will lead to a decrease in the overall output power. There is also a current sensor at the input. The microchip monitors the voltage drop across this sensor to limit the current through the inductor. This is not full current stabilization, just a limitation. Since the current will vary depending on many factors, it is important to design this circuit for a specific input voltage so that the current does not exceed the required limits. Here is the formula for calculating the output current, where RCS is the shunt resistance in ohms. I think the calculation of the output voltage is clear. The circuit also has a charge indicator. If there are control pulses at the output of the microchip, the transistor will turn on and the LED will light up. If the pulses disappear, the LED will turn off. Assembly won't be a hassle if you use factory-made boards, soldering paste, and have a small hot plate in your toolkit. All capacitors and resistors are in the 1206 form factor. The inductor should be rated for a current of 7 to 10 amps, with a minimum of 5 to 6 amps. After assembly is complete, clean the printed circuit board. Ours is double-sided. The second side is a solid ground plane and also serves as a heat sink. Heat from some of the power components is transferred to the bottom plane through VIAS. Next, you'll need a Type-C trigger for 9 volts. You can use a 12 volt one too, but you'll need to recalculate the shunt, otherwise the charging current will be too high. The trigger is soldered to the bottom plane as shown. By the way, you can also supply 5 volts to the circuit input. It's important that the power adapter is powerful enough and can provide an output current of at least 3.5 amps. Depending on the supply voltage, the charging power will vary. Standard adapters at 9 or 12 volts provide 3 to 3.5 amps, which is a maximum of 42 watts. The 60 watt power I mentioned earlier is not achieved with a smartphone adapter, but with a powerful power supply, for example, one used for LED strips. I think that's all clear. Next, let's test the device. I strongly recommend using precise and thermally stable resistors with a tolerance of 1% or less in the voltage divider. It's better to set the output voltage in the range of 20 and a half to 20.8 volts. The battery will be slightly undercharged, but it will be safe. When you turn on the power, the LED will blink slightly. Check the output voltage. If everything looks good, connect the battery for charging. A slight heating of the converter, especially the diodes, is normal and to be expected. After a while, the LED will turn off. Check the voltage on the battery, make sure everything is working as it should, and that the battery is charged. Next, print the device case on a 3D printer. It also serves as an attachment for the battery. I downloaded the lower part of the model online, and the upper part was designed to fit my needs. I highly recommend printing with ABS plastic, which is more heat resistant compared to PETG or PLA. It turned out pretty well. Install the board into the case and everything is ready. Next, I made the terminals out of galvanized steel, although you can buy this part ready-made and it's not expensive. The device is now completely ready to use. Let me remind you that all the necessary information, including the schematic, Gerber files, PCBs for factory ordering, as well as a link to the project page, can be found in the description. With this I can only say goodbye, and until we meet again. Bye!